All right, folks, welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. And today, we are digging a little bit deep into the solo catalog of uh, none other than D.D.Y., Dennis D. Young. And who's going to help me do that? Who else? Mr. Dennis D. Young, aficionado, Mr. Tom Jennings. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ni Niagara Falls Music Hall of Fame honoree. Don't forget, don't forget uh -huh. to put that on there. Uh, okay. And you are uh, you are the what the Mac Bell the Cowboy Award Cowboy winning. Mac Bell yes. Award winning journalist <laughs> and my good friend, Mr. Joe <laughs> that's, Joseph Suto. That's the best part. Good friend, you know. That's that's you, the best. We, friend. we are yep. good friends. Yep, we are exactly. I, you know, if I don't say it enough, Joey, I love you, man. You're a good friend. You've been a great friend. And I enjoy these. Uh, I enjoy our album rankings, but I enjoy our relationship even more than our album rankings. Yeah, that's what helps make these rankings even better, for sure. For sure. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, today we're going to start off a little bit different before we get into the bulk of the uh, catalog here, of Mr. Dennis DeYoung. I'm going to leave, start going to give you a question that we're going to wait for your answer late at the end of the segment. When we're all done ranking, we're just going to give you a little bit of time to ponder it as we discuss Dennis DeYoung here. And we just want to ask you, should Styx drop Mr. Roboto from the set list? Because uh, this is a great oh. discussion we're going to have because of the fact, number one, <laughs> it's a Dennis DeYoung song. And it seemed to be one of the songs that kind of divided the band back up during the Kilroy days there. And we're going to get more into that as we uh, at the end of the show. But for now, I just wanted to give you a heads up on what we're going to discuss. And now we're going to dig deep into the ranking of the Dennis DeYoung catalog. Yeah. And I don't know if you want to do a little rundown and let people know, you know, your take on Dennis's solo career. My take on it? Mm hmm. I mean, he's, he he did. Uh, we're only dealing with the six contemporary albums. He did a ten on Broadway and a Hunchback of Notre Dame soundtrack, and there's a a live record that uh, Dennis DeYoung sings the music of Styx, mm -hmm. which is an excellent live recording, by the way. It really is. It's uh, fantastic renditions of Styx live recordings. I would say it's it's actually it's not as good as Return to Paradise, but certainly better than Caught in the Act in terms of the sound quality and uh, even the performances. To some degree, there's some sticks fan going sacrilege, but no, that's the way I feel. And what I love about solo works by artists who become known in a band is that it really gives you an opportunity to kind of understand the DNA and who really contributes what. Now, I, I say that there's a caveat because obviously. You know, you, again, you look at the Beatles, you know, John Lennon's solo career versus Paul McCartney's solo career, you know, things like that. And obviously, you know, the simplistic version is, oh, you know, Paul writes all the love ballads and John writes all the complex songs. But, you know, they 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 each kind of bring out some things in each other that, you know, they, they that, that, that buck those stereotypes. But in the case of certainly Dennis DeYoung is that Dennis DeYoung was, you when you listen to his solo work, the thing that I came away with is a much deeper understanding of what he really brought to sticks as a song as a songwriter and also uh what the other guys brought you know because because those are the elements that are missing on on some of his solo works okay very good well without further ado let's dig right in and uh what do you what are you going to start off with as uh your least favorite Dennis the Young album or the one you feel just wasn't as good as the others. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> I'm trying to read my writing. It's not always the greatest. Uh, the first one I have is Back to the World, which was his second solo album. And uh, the big hit, a big hit on that, I guess, or the one that this, the kind of the standout song was uh, This Is the Time, which is a song I really love. And there's a there's this Dennis the Young Ultimate Collection, which covers the first three solo albums. I believe this was a, a track that's on it as well. Uh, the issue I really have with this one is that, and I, and I think uh, I'll probably discuss this a little bit more in terms of Desert Moon as well, and Boom Child. Uh, it's just the production qualities. I, I'm not a real, I'm not a fan of the keyboard sound. 
I don't, it is a lot of the songs kind of sound a little bit too uh, adult contemporary 80s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's just, yeah. uh, you know, Chicago ish and that kind of thing. So, uh, a little bit, little, just a little bit too much filler on this one in terms of his solo recordings. And I, and I think that, and again, I say, I think, because I, I don't know, but I kind of got the sense that, you know, you sticks had broken up. He did the two records, he had the hit with desert moon. And then he kind of tried to, to repeat that formula. And I think he was consciously trying to avoid his solo work sounding too much like sticks, you know, because there, it just doesn't, a lot of this stuff doesn't really sound like the guy that we knew as the lead singer of sticks. You know what I mean? Hmm. Okay. That's what I got. So that's what number, number six for you is back to the world. His second yeah. solo album. Correct. All right. Well, I got a different one. Mine is oh. going to actually, my number six is going to be his third solo album, which was boom child mm. uh, released in 1988 kind of kind of signified you know that it was the first solo album that he had released up to that point that failed to chart on the billboard top 200 and um you know there, there's a couple good songs on here though I, I i really went back and tried to find some things to like about this album and believe it or not i actually did i'll tell you the first time i was first couple times i listened to it because it's been a while this <laughs> came out way back in 88 one of those cds that you just kind of got on the shelf there you rarely ever pull it off i mean you know that that's a lot problem with when you got there's so much music to go through and you know we just haven't gotten deep into these solo catalogs yet but this is the first opportunity i had so um you know i really like beneath the moon i think that's probably the best song on the album which is the lead off track uh what a way to go was another one that kind of stood out for me and uh outside looking in again uh near mm -hmm. the end of the album that, that's another one i i thought was definitely uh very very good a little bit different like you said though the album definitely sounds dated production wise mm -hmm. and yeah. you know just everything else because of the fact that um you know he actually had changed uh record labels too he the first two albums were released on a and m which was the label he was signed on with sticks and everything and then, of course, he goes over to the great MCA, of course. <laughs> so, you know, he, he kind of got lost in the shuffle with them, like so did anybody else that was, a, you know, from that period of time, MCA was just, uh, that wasn't their main focus because they had obviously Olivia Newton-John, they had all these other artists that were more contemporary and bigger that they were promoting, and that's what sold the bulk of their catalog, you know those artists that were pushing double triple four times platinum back in the late eighties and first part of the nineties. Yeah. So, you know, so that, that's why I think had it gotten a little bit more promotion, I think, you know, who knows, you know, it might, it might've caught on a little bit. Cause like I mentioned, there was a good handful of songs from this album that I definitely like. Uh, but unfortunately uh, not enough compared to the rest of the catalog, which is why I have it at number six. <laughs> numero six <clears throat> um and my numero five since we're going on to numero five because i'll discuss boom child when i when i get to it mm -hmm. and uh i will say when i first when i first did my initial rankings before i did a, a kind of a second run through of some stuff i i did have it at number six but i, I bumped it up a little bit but you know we'll get there mm -hmm. and um uh, my next one is desert moon which this kind of surprised me because I thought it would be a little <laughs> bit higher because I remember when it came out and I really enjoyed it. And let's be honest, the title track desert moon is brilliant. It It is uh -huh. as good as anything Dennis DeYoung has ever done. It is an incredible song. Uh, unfortunately it's, it's a standout on the record. Like there's no, there's no song that's even close to as good to it on the record. And again, this suffers from some real production issues in terms of, again, I feel like this attempt to kind of move away from that, that heavier rock sound and more towards the, you know, adult contemporary. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess that's what, what Dennis was doing at the time. And I, I understand the, the audience he was kind of reaching for, but 
again, I, I just, you know, as an, as a whole, um, and again, we're talking about a six record catalog and I don't think any, I don't think Dennis is, is, has the, is capable of really, really putting out a dud. I mean, the guy's just incredibly talented. So uh, I'm not saying that this album sucks. I'm just saying that, you know, it definitely, it definitely, it definitely sounds like a product of its time. And you can't even necessarily say that about a couple of sticks albums, at least not the classics, you know, like grand illusion, piece of eight mm. uh, paradise theater, you know, even Equinox, some of those, I mean, they still, they still just sound very vibrant. Uh, they, they seem to somehow avoid some of those pitfalls in terms of production, but this one, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was, uh, I don't even know who produced this record. Was it what Gary Leozo or something like that? Or, but it just, it, it, I, I, I don't like the keyboard sounds on it. Um, it just doesn't, it, it's just not, you know, the song, I, I think the songs suffer because of the production. I think the songs yeah. are stronger than the production. Does that make sense? Yeah. Get ready. It was actually Dennis that produced it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as I said, I mean, he's, uh, <clears throat> You know, I, 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 a lot of times these guys, they leave their band and they don't want to, they don't want to be compared to, to what they did in the previous band. If their plan is to get back with the band, you know, staying when he was doing solo albums, uh, there were a lot of his solo albums that just didn't sound anything like the police. He, he could, he seemed right. to avoid that sound. Uh, Phil Collins with Genesis, you know, when he stepped away and did Phil Collins solo albums, he wanted them to sound like Phil Collins solo albums, not, Genesis album. So I don't fault Dennis for it. I mean, I, I, I think that he was definitely kind of reaching for a little bit more of an adult contemporary sound. Again, that kind of Chicago y thing, kind of moving away from the some of the synth sounds that Sticks had become known for. But I don't know. It just it it just falls short. It it just it's again, it's one of those things that it's kind of what everybody was doing at the time, and it just doesn't. It just doesn't hold up well. None of the records from that era really hold up well from a production standpoint. True. You know, everybody tried to be the next David Foster. You know, they were all looking for that kind of success. Yeah, that's why they, a lot of these bands had to remaster the whole catalog to get, really bring out the um, the sound aspects, you know. And a lot of them have done a really great job, which helped, in, you know, helped if you buy some of these remasters, they do a they sound a whole lot better and cleaner and better, but, um, you know, it's just a whole nother time in that whole era from the eighties. Like you said. Yeah. Now, a lot like, of high end, a lot of high end on yeah. desert mode, you know, a lot of high end. Now you mentioned Gary Luazo, uh, give us, uh, you know, what famous band he was in at one point. You stopped me, Joey. Really? Okay. I was, he was the lead singer of the American breed, the classic. Oh, goodness. Ben, yeah. Ben oh, me, shape me. Yeah, Ben Me Shape Me, yeah. Yep. He worked with Sticks, didn't he? Yep. Okay, that's what I thought. Yep. Hmm. They they actually let him come up on stage and sing it during one of the Sticks concerts uh, right before, uh, sadly, that he uh, passed away. Oh, yeah. So that was a pretty cool... You could find it on YouTube. It's a pretty cool uh, thing to watch if you ever get a chance yeah. to see it. I, I'll I'm look glad, for it. I'm glad they did that. That was pretty cool. And be, Believe it or not, that American breed, Ben Me Shape Me, it was like the, one of the first albums I ever got. My mother bought it for me when I was like a wee little lad. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah, I uh, my first ever record was Beatles Abbey Road. And uh, I mean, records I remember like pre, you know, contemporary. I, I remember Snoopy and the Red Bear and like yes. owning that. Oh, you yeah. know? And 20, 30, 40, 50 or more. Yeah. Red Bear. Yeah, wow. It was, uh, it was fun stuff. And then, it's, uh, it's just weird how these al these albums and these people <laughs> connect with us right, right now. Who would have thought we'd be sure. talking American Breed and Snoopy versus the Red Baron? But it all, yeah. it's weird how the music kind of all brings everything together like that. Yeah, it's know? like Ted, Ted, Ted Templeman, you know, producer of those Van Halen, Doobie Brothers, Little Feet, a lot of great bands. You know, he was, he was in, uh, uh, what that was Harper's Bazaar, I think, was the the band he was in. You know, they did the the, mm. the feeling groovy song or whatever. So yeah, <laughs> just strange. Yeah. All right. So you got Desert Moon at number five. Uh, my number numero five, Mister Jennings, <laughs> is <laughs> none other than a surprise. You probably wouldn't have expected me to have it this high up, but it is. And that's where it's going to stay for me. Uh, 26 East Volume 1. 
Mm, 2020. Yeah, I mean, I like the playing on it. I really do, but the songs just don't really do a lot for me. I mean, I, I you know, there's a there's a handful I enjoy, you know, like uh yep. run uh you you my love is 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 a interesting song, Unbroken, um To the Good Old Days. That's a that's a classic right there, uh classic Dennis song. Mm. But um a lot of the other ones to me, they, I don't know. They just don't really uh, bring anything on home for me on these ones. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's, even though I like the playing, um, it just seems like there's a lot of, I expected more out of Dennis, especially this late in his, in his career. I know you probably view it a little bit differently. Oh um, yeah. I got a lot. I got a lot higher. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, got a lot higher. <laughs> I don't know. I, for me, it just, uh, and I played these albums pretty, long, you know, pretty yeah. good a bunch of times. And it, it just, like I said, I mean, each time I listened to it, maybe I started liking it a little bit more, you know, it's number five, not number six, yeah. but um, still that that's where I got it, unfortunately. So East volume one from the 2020 is coming in at number five. Now did that, that, did that come out the same time as the mission or the same time as crash of the crown? Uh, neither. <laughs> Cause one of them came out like, yeah, two of them was, came out at the same time. Yeah. Dennis it was volume six. Yeah. It was, it was volume the, two and crash two. of the crown. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we did a review on that together. We kind of did, them did. On the same episode. Yeah. Yeah. You and know, so, my, you know how, you know, how my memory is. <laughs> so we, we got to, ch- so we'll, 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 we'll put that in the link uh, for you people who want to check those reviews out individually. Yeah, Cause we go more, yeah. we go more into detail, obviously. Yeah. Go back. All right. So my next one is, uh, which I think, believe is number four mm-hmm. is a uh, boom child, baby. Mm. Boom child, baby. And, uh, I, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the song Boom Child. I see what Dennis was doing there. I mean, you know, it's almost, it was like a kind of a sped up version of Roboto. And I love Roboto. I mean, anybody, anybody who don't like Roboto, what's wrong with you? Everybody loves Roboto. Universally loves song. And we'll get to that at the end of the thing, which by the way, when Joey asked me that uh, question about Mr. Roboto, he didn't prep me for that one. So now I got my brain thinking, but, uh, I think with Boom Child, it it really it, there were some just moments of utter brilliance on this record, like just oh, great classic Dennis material. And uh, the two I wrote down were, you know, what a way to go, which I think you mentioned as well when you when you brought this particular record up. But then that that song, Harry's Hands, man, what a great song! Say so it kind of reminds me of like a classic Billy Joel song from early in billy joel's career i just love the the narrative you know you kind of fall in love with the character and all that other stuff and you know before we go any further let me let me tell you dennis de young if you ever watch this that's such a great song but one of these other things that i just love about dennis is he he always gets a little bit of himself in his records and and there's you know he manages to get his wife's name mentioned and mm. It's such a great love story. You know, I mean, she's inspired some some beautiful love songs. And it's nice to know that he could still write those love songs right up to the end. But yeah, but I don't know, man. That song, Harry's Hands, it, it's just such a great song. It really is. And, uh, you know, but but the album, it it doesn't, it's, it must have come out, I think it came out in the CD era. So I think maybe mm-hmm. he was feeling a little pressured to put a little more material. If this record was 35 minutes it could have been darn near perfect, but there's, uh, there's just a little bit of filler on there. Okay. All right. Let's see what we got for my <laughs> number four. And that's going to be none other than East volume two at number four from 20. We're not, we 21. may not agree on anything here, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't Maybe I don't know, we'll see. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> so uh this one a little bit better than east volume one um what i liked best about volume two was um yeah a few more songs stood out for me uh the last guitar hero was one mm-hmm. that was pretty cool uh proof of heaven uh made oh, yeah. for each other which was probably a song 
about his wife, <laughs> more than likely. Um, there's no turning back time. There's no turning back time. That one, definitely, a, I think that's one of the, that, that might be the gem on the album, in my estimation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, definitely a stronger album than volume one. I like the retro look on these albums. It makes it look like they're older than they really are with the uh, design of the covers. Kind of gives that old school flavor when you look back at some of these covers. It gives you that retro look. Um, maybe it was, not. It was, just, it was just a mock-up of Meet the Beatles, basically. Yeah. 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 So I thought that was pretty cool how he did those uh, covers like that. Um, and the last song on the album, the grand finale. Um mm interesting way to close out his uh, career because it sounds like he's definitely done making at least albums. I don't know if he's going to do anything else. He's been kind of silent over the past uh, little while. He's done some interviews, but haven't really heard much. I don't think he's going to be doing any more live shows, at least not full touring, right? I, you know, I think that's a rumor. There's like a quote in the New York Post from Tommy Shaw. It says Dennis is retired, but it's like I never heard it officially. But I, I I feel like I feel like Tommy and Dennis don't talk. So, <laughs> I mean, where's he getting that information from? I don't, I don't know. I mean, Dennis is seventy seven years old, You're right? Um, but I mean, I I don't know. I mean, if the guy can still sing, which I, I mean, he's never he's never shown any kind of deterioration in his voice, not on record, not live. No, nope. I mean if he if he can do it, he he would hopefully go out. I would assume he'd just do a handful of shows. But listen, Dennis, if you need to do like a warm up show, or if you just want to hang with a couple of guys to talk, this is my personal invitation to you. I would. You could pl you could play a show in my backyard here. Joe will come <laughs> out with. We'll get a handful of friends, and we'll record a podcast episode. <laughs> and you know what? It'll get it'll get news worldwide. And you won't find a guy that's more appreciative of it than, well, two guys. Joey, how blown away would you be if he did that? Hey, come to Batavia Downs again. He's he was a no, 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 no. We want him. We want him at just my. <laughs> we want a backyard show. Did you did you ever get a chance to see Dennis uh, solo, like uh, not solo, but uh, unplugged? Any of those unplugged shows? No. Oh wow, just wow. That's all I got to say. It, 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 uh, my wife and I went. Tracy. And it was 2009. It was just, it was surreal. It was, it was incredible. And, you know, when you take some of these songs that are, that have these big production values, you know, and then you just strip them down to like a guy on a piano with a couple acoustic guitars or whatever, no big drum kit. I mean, mm -hmm. you just go, wow, holy crap. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with, with uh, some of those uh, post sticks solo albums, you know, the A&M, &M, the MCA, MCA stuff. Just, you know, they, they, there was so much production to it. But as I said, you, there's no question the guy can write a song. I mean, he writes brilliant songs. He's, he's, a, he's a, people don't say it enough about Dennis Young. He's a musical genius. He's, just, he's an absolute genius. Yeah. And Dennis, come on with us. We'll, we'll flatter you even more. It's just a sin, it's sincere flattery. <laughs> sincere. So, yeah. All right. So that was, uh, my number four. What do you got for number three? I got the same thing you got for number four. I got volume two. Okay. 26 East volume two. The only one you didn't put on here was Isle of Misanthrope. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that. Properly. Right. You mentioned that during, I remember during our um, review of it, you yeah, mentioned yeah, that, yeah. that song. I wanted to let you give you some thunder here so you could talk about that one. The thunder, thunder. I, yeah, steal, I, I, I love the song. Steal. It, it's yeah. uh, <clears throat> it's weird because like, you know, both sticks and Dennis Young, they seem to go back to those proggy roots. That sort of, it seems like they drew from that wooden nickel era. Which, whenever you talk to a member of the sticks, they're like, I don't, know, I hate the wooden nickel era. I love the wooden nickel era. I mean, it's not, it's, it's different. You know, it's, it's certainly the songs were not quite as strong as the uh AM era you know but you know i i mean and i'm gonna put this out there in the hopes that tommy shaw's not watching <laughs> i love tommy shaw and i you know but 
I mean, Dennis was there before Tommy. And I, and I always wondered like if JC had stayed, would sticks still, I don't know that sticks would have been as popular if Tommy wasn't in sticks, but I still think sticks would have been popular. You know, mm-hmm. what do you think? Or is that not even worth discussing? Yeah. I, I don't know. That's a, I think that's a whole nother discussion. Cause I, yeah. You know, like you said, a lot of people do, and they they still embrace that wooden nickel era. I'm not really that big into it because I've never really, um, you know, I've listened to it all, but I'm I've never really, you know, totally locked myself into it. Probably just because of how great the AM and M years are, and I'm probably one of the biggest Tommy Shaw fans on the face of the earth. So, <laughs> right, it's just kind of hard for me to fathom the band uh, ever having that happen, but. You know, it's something we can discuss down the road when we have one of our other sticks related uh, videos for sure. We'll bring in uh, maybe Mr. Davey Creighton to see what he has to say about that. Yeah. Should be yeah. interesting. Because <laughs> he's big on the wooden nickel area. He's definitely one of those guys. Very so. proggy stuff, you know, kind of groundbreaking. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was kind of pre Queen before Queen too, with those big choruses and it really established their sound. I mean, you know, the thing was with Tommy is that Tommy's, um, I think, I think what really made sticks work. And again, this, this, this is all tied in because, you know, at the beginning, we kind of talked about how you can, you can, you get the DNA, you know, like you, you hear sticks records without Dennis, you hear Tommy solo records, uh, there's damn Yankees, you know, all that stuff. So now we have a, a sampling of of Tommy, you know, even even as in as much as he's done a bluegrass bluegrass album, you know, mm-hmm. JY. I mean, the JY records, uh, three solo records, sound very, you know, kind of rocker, wooden nickel area ish, you know, the Hendrix influences and all that stuff's there. So you you see where Dennis brought in that edge, um, but I think that I think the cultural piece is 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 what what both made and and eventually destroyed Sticks because you got a guy from Alabama. And you got a guy from Chicago. And when you take those two musical influences and you meld them together, it's it's something beautiful. And Tommy's voice and and Dennis's voice were, you know, Simon and Garfunkel. I mean, it it's just there's just to, to the Everly brothers, you know, these you get these voices that come together and they just make beautiful music like no other. And uh, I don't want to take anything away from JY because JY was a very important part of the stick of the sticks's choruses as well. But there's nothing quite like, you know, Dennis and Tommy's voice uh, blended together. But again, I think that's where there might have been eventually that disconnect between the two because you have this kind of, you know, this guy from Chicago with the with a big personality and then you got this this kind of young man from the south with a with a little more, you know, kind of understated, folky approach, you know. And I know people don't think of Tom Tommy Shaw as folksy. But certainly the personalities are very different. You know, Tommy has always come off as kind of chill and laid back, whereas Dennis is 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 a larger than life figure. Uh, and that works because they counterbalance each other. You know, well, Lennon, Lennon, the crazy guy, the, the avant garde, the nutty one, you know, McCartney, the, the sensible one, you know, the, the one who had the pop sensibilities. So when they meet or when they compete against each other, it just creates some great stuff. So there you go. What does that have to do with 26 East Volume 2? Nothing. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, a little real- bit. Again, again, a little yeah. bit. Because, again, it shows what – because because this is this is the ugly truth of the business. I mean, you know, Dennis, Dennis, based on what everything's gone on in the music business today, if Dennis could have been the guy that held the copyright to Sticks, and it could just be Dennis and his current band going to Sticks, and Tommy and JY would have to go out as another name. You know, sometimes it's just the last man standing that gets the name, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, and, and then your point, getting back to Tommy and his folksy and, you know, being down from the South, I think you see more of that influence in his later catalog, his later solo catalog. A lot of the songs have that have that feel. You know, he's got the one where he does with Ed Roland from Collective Soul, another Southern guy on, uh, I think it's the the... the you know, the, the one solo album. Um, and then he's got the bluegrass. So, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff. I like the variety, you know, and, and oh, for I, sure. And I, and I don't think there was, I mean, I have to crawl through my brain, but I, I can't think of any, there certainly wasn't any hits. I can't think of any real prominent songs 
in the sixth catalog that featured an acoustic guitar before Tommy joined the band. So he brought that element in too. Yeah. You know, Chris, Crystal Ball, Fooling Yourself. I mean, Lights. I mean, all those songs. I mean, that acoustic guitar piece is just. Oh, down the river with the mandolin. Yeah. Mandolin, you know, oh, those wow. stringed instruments. I mean, they're just, they're just absolutely beautiful. Yeah. All right. So let me get into mine here. Um, so number three for me is none other than 100 years from now, 2009. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is definitely uh, one of his more solid albums. I would say this is about mm. where I feel where the catalog. This is where I, you're starting to get into the with me starting to get into the meat of the catalog. You know, sometimes, you know, some bands that let's be honest, you only might you might only like one album, which would be your number one. Others, you might like all five. You might like all six of them at this point. But one's got to be number six. One's got to be number five and so forth. But. In this case, I'd say this is about right where I really started really liking. This album is, is, a, is definitely a good good double thumbs up for me. Um, title track kicks it off 100 years from now. I'll just mention a couple songs because I know, obviously, you haven't mentioned it yet. So um, mm -hmm. I like Rain. Rain is definitely one of the highlights of the album. And if I have to name one other one, there was a time, I'd say really really like it a lot of a lot of his songs here are, are typical dennis songs but they really stand out and like you said unlike his earlier catalog it doesn't sound like it's really dated you know nope. the earlier catalog yeah. sounds like it belongs in the 80s this album 2009 but it, it, could, it could have fallen at almost anywhere because that's how the material just sounds so much fresher yeah so you know, a great album. Uh, I think this is definitely where where it starts picking up for me with his catalog, and that's why uh, I've got this one at number uh, three. Anyhow, number two for me, because this is going to give away my number one, is 26 East Volume 1, which, of course, you had lower as well. Uh, and I'm right, and you're wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Don't we always say this at this point of the show, folks? Our opinions are our opinions. Yeah. Are we correct? No, it's it's all subjective. This is just an opportunity to give you something to think about and make your own rating, which may be different than ours. Anyhow, uh, and again, when you have six records, there's any number of combinations of things that you can come up with. This particular record, I I don't know if I, you know. I, I love it because it's it's a very there's a very strong opener, uh, East of Midnight, and I think it is again a record that does not sound like, uh, you know it 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 begins to, it was the the second time that he kind of embraced his sticksness, you know, and 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 it, so maybe there was some resolution there in the sense that, you know, sticks is not going to get back together. And I should reclaim my rightful <laughs> spot as the, the the person who did this in sticks, and I'll prove it because I'll do it again. You know, he writes songs of a uh, of a sticks bent and of a sticks quality, and I think that that he did that intentionally, and and he succeeds. Uh, the band is really good. The playing's excellent. You know, both uh, volume one and volume two, the guitar work is is uh, miles above almost anything else aside from my number one and uh it, it, they're just they're great they're two great companion pieces i mean you it's a you know this is a rock star with a late career statement and he's got jim peterick did i pronounce that last name correct mm -hmm. the guy from uh survivor helping him out and i think sometimes you know even you know going back to paul mccartney you know after john lennon died mccartney did some songs with uh, elvis costello which was some of his best post Beatles work because he was working with somebody else. I think sometimes when you work with another songwriter, it just, it just makes you a better songwriter. So um, love the album, love the cover, love the artwork. Uh, it came out on vinyl. Love the fact that I was able to finally get a Dennis T young record on vinyl after 20 some odd years. And, you know, so there you go. All right. So uh, my number two takes us back to 1986 we're going back to the world oh back my to six. the world 
Yeah, yep. It charted at number 108, so it was a big letdown from his uh, debut, but uh, it did have a couple songs that cracked the top 100. Uh, Call Me that, that you mentioned at number 54, and This Is The Time made number 93. Uh, A&M, is, it would turn out to be his last album with a and I guess he got dumped after uh, the disappointing follow-up to Desert Moon. Um Maybe know, he chose. Maybe he chose to leave and didn't get dumped. Are we being presumptuous? <laughs> well, considering he was on A and M and that was Six's yeah. label, I would assume he got dumped, just because yeah. of the vast difference from where Desert Moon was compared to Back to the World. You know, I mean, I don't know one hundred percent for sure. I'll be the first to admit that. You know, but um, that's what it seems like to me. But you know, back to the world, you know, this is something, I, this album I I had ever since it came out pretty much. And I, I'll tell you, I never really ever touched it. You know, you know, I gave it the once listen or something back, you know, when it first came out, maybe played it once or twice since then. And then when we decided to go up oh, time to do Dennis the Young catalog, I pull it out and I'll go, wow, the more, every time I listen to this one, I like it more and more. I definitely mm-hmm. feel it, it's grown on me over the last, uh, couple months here because i started ranking this one you know way back in like december january because we were originally were going to do a tommy dennis combination thing and then we decided eh, let's put it on hold and we ended up just doing dennis i'm sure we'll be doing tommy down the road um but um yeah back to the world you know um unanswered prayers is another uh good song that i liked and warning shot surprisingly that one seemed more like a, a song that you know i thought would get airplay even more so than uh and then you know i think this is the time i remember i remember hearing that when it first came out this is the time that that's the kick off the lead off track on the album <clears throat> but other than that you know you you really would have been hard pressed to hear it around buffalo at the time because 97 rock at that point was no longer and um our rock radio focused more on the hits and whoever was popular at the time. And obviously Dennis wasn't, uh, wasn't it it at that point, no longer in sticks and everything. So, so number two, back to the world. And that's going to get us down to the drum roll for Mr. Jennings here. What you got? Well, my number one, I'm, I'm, you, you know this because I've, I know I've it. sang the praises of this record a <laughs> hundred years from now, and I, I don't know. I listened to it again today, and I'm, <laughs> I'm in my car, and I'm just going, this thing's incredible. Like it's, it's the, the only problem I have with this record is that more people haven't heard it. I, it, it's so good. It, it is a, it is in some ways a lost sticks record. I feel like if this was if this material had been presented to sticks instead of say you know Brave New World, mm. uh, or, or even Edge of the Century. I mean, Edge of the Century still had uh, some great Dennis stuff on it. You know, Show Me the Way. I mean, what, uh, you know, Show Me the Way, classic song. Um, it it's just you know thematically, uh, Dennis Dennis has a, has it kind of going back to that you know Paradise Theater, Pieces of Eight, Grand Illusion, the materialism but he kind of ramps it up a little bit. Um, his vocal performance on it is just astounding. I, I, I'll, I mean, that's anything I listen to with Dennis sting, singing. I, I'm just, I'm just amazed by it. He has such control over his voice and just the things that he does with it are uh, he's so underrated in that respect, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there's always talk about, you know, oh, Gowan or, or De Young or whatever. There's no comparison. Very different singers. Very different. And uh, I love Larry Gowan. I love, Le- but, but man, but Dennis De Young is Dennis De Young. And he just, this record is like, this is the one that makes me sad that he wasn't able to do this with Tommy J.Y. Because it, it, because I, I, although this may sound sacrilegious, but I don't know that they could have added much to it. I, I mean, it's just that good. Like he just, I don't know what it was at that time, what was driving him to, to create this album. But I just find it, I find it as, as close to quality as anything sticks ever did. And probably in comparison to at least paradise theater. 
Uh, certainly not to the level of, you know, Grand Illusion piece of eight, which is really the super sweet spot for sticks. Um, I wouldn't compare it to Cornerstone because I think Cornerstone is a, it, it's a personal favorite of mine, but I know a lot, I know that's a very divisive cattle uh, album in the catalog, but uh, I don't know, man. I just, I just absolutely love this record. I would say, yeah, if I was going to, if this was a sticks record, I'd probably put it in the top five. Wow. That's high praise. Yeah. 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 Cause sticks, it sticks got a lot of great outs. Oh yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's his number one. And I guess I'm I'm probably with the the majority on this one, seeing how this album that I got at number one is the biggest selling album out yeah. of all Styx solo members, uh, you know, out of all the solo albums released by any Styx member. This one has sold the most copies and charted higher than any of the others. And that is none other than Desert Moon, the debut from Dennis DeYoung, came out in 1984. And... Um, you know, uh, just hit number 24 on the Billboard album charts. Uh, obviously, on the strength of the song Desert Moon, which hit number 10 on the charts, which was, uh, you know, it really started off his solo career in, in the right on the right path and everything. And it's just a shame yeah. that he wasn't able to keep it rolling because who knows, you know, we could be looking at a whole different thing if his solo career really, really picked up. I mean, we might not have seen Return to Paradise with Sticks if his solo career really shot up where he was able to get get big. You, you just don't know, you know, because yeah. Desert Moon definitely kicked this whole thing off in fine style for him by not only landing a top 10 song, but landing that album in, you know, in the top 25. So, you know, it, what, I, what you, you mentioned it already. Obviously, Desert Moon, the total standout on the album. I mean, there's yep. nothing that comes close, like you mentioned. That was a great way of describing it. But there are a couple songs I like that I thought were really good songs, but nowhere in the same league as Desert Moon, and that would be the first two. Uh, the lead-off track, Don't Wait for Heroes, and Please. Um, those are the two that really stand out for me. Um, you know, some other ones on here that, you know, like Boys Will Be Boys featured Suzanne on vo lead, uh, background vocals, his wife. And, um, you know, he had a whole, whole lot of guests play on the album, um, you know, throughout, throughout the whole album, he had a bunch of different people playing on it. Um, you know, as, as did a lot of the other sticks members, uh, you know, and, and like you said, Gary, Gary did, uh, help with the engineering and mixing, but he just didn't get no production credit at all. It all went, okay. to Dennis. it all went to Dennis. So I'm sure Gary yeah. was working very closely with him on the whole thing. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, you know, just just to me, the my favorite Den Dennis DeYoung solo album and uh, justifiably so uh, definitely to me, this is the standout of his whole catalog. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. So that that concludes. Do you have any final thoughts regarding uh, the catalog itself or anything else you want to add regarding Dennis uh, before we get into our. Uh, final segment of this episode i don't know on a personal note he's one of the first guys i ever interviewed F funny story like i was i was uh and dennis Young used to be a teacher and i'm still a teacher and, and i was in my classroom and uh he was in the central time zone and i was in the eastern time zone mm -hmm. and uh, my phone rings my desk phone rings and i expected him at like i think it was 11 o'clock and so i get this call at 10 o'clock and uh, I pick up the phone and go, yeah, hey, Mr. Jennings is in the room. He goes, Tom Jennings? Dennis Young." And I'm like, oh, so, uh, uh, I, 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 I thought you were calling in another hour. You know, he's like, so when I first got him on the phone, he scared the living. Can I say the S word? <laughs> he scared the living shit out of me. I mean, I was like, I'm just like, you know. And then within maybe 20, 25 minutes, I'll never forget what he said this. It was such an incredible moment. He goes, uh, I could tell you're a real fan, Tom, you know, and that meant a lot to me. And the, and the interview was, was phenomenal. Now I, I did share with him another story. If you don't mind me rambling a little bit, cause there were only six records. When I was, uh, when I was like 14 or 15 years old, my mother had a uh, friend who used to, get change at the bank that the bank she worked at she was a bank teller mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. at, for for the vending. And she was to sell T-shirts at the concert. So she let me in early to catch a Sticks sound check. And uh, I was in there. I had a, a Pieces of Eight music book that I was hoping to get signed, which eventually I did. I still have it. I should have broken it out for this segment or whatever. But um, I'm standing there. They they go through the first song. And I'm I'm pretty sure it was Rock in the Paradise. And then Dennis says, you know, hey, who are you, young man? And I said, uh, I said, I'm like, oh, my name's Tom Jenny. I'm your world's biggest fan. He goes, hey, I think, no, I said, I'm Tom Jenny. I think you guys are the greatest fan in the world. And he's like, I think you're right, Tom. So I said, I was wondering if I could get an autograph. He says, well, we got to get through one more song and then I'll, I'll give you, give you an autograph. So they start the next song and the uh, security comes to kick me out. And Dennis stops security while he's in the middle of sound check and he's not doing his vocals and says, no, 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 leave the kid here. Mm-hmm. Song ends, passes the book around. I get a guitar pick from Tommy. I get a set of drumsticks from John Panazzo. Nice. Incredible. And I said to Dennis, I go, you know, dude, you're like one of the first rock stars I ever met. And, and you were just so cool. And he said, yeah, it sounds like something, sounds like something I would do, but <laughs> you know what? It was nice that I was able to share that, that moment with him because, you know, I mean, these, these guys, uh, you know, he said, t- what's, what's the line in show me the way, you know, our heroes turn into idols of, of clay. Mm. Uh, Dennis never did that for me. He was, he's just somebody, a guy that I just have so much respect and admiration for. And, uh, and I still love sticks. I still love the current lineup of sticks, but I will never, I will never, my affection for Dennis Seale will <laughs> never wane. He is, uh, just an incredible guy that, uh, you know, it's a shame that the, that the, the guys can't get along in terms of just being, just saying nice things about each other, you know? And, and I think they do, I think they do. And, you know, there's a lot of talk in the fan base more about the, you know, everybody's saying all these terrible things. And I, and I don't think, I don't think Babe broke up the band. I don't think Mr. Roboto broke up the band. I just, you know what? Things happen. You know, they, they, you get older. Sometimes you get along. Sometimes you don't, you know? Yeah. All right. So let's dig into our question that I sprung on you there at the beginning here, where we talked yeah. about, um, so back in, uh, I'm not even really sure what year that was, but it was a uh, sticks, uh, over the last little while decided, Oh, let's, let's start playing Mr. Roboto. And I remember I interviewed uh, Lawrence Gowan about it and, uh, Oh, they, they love the song. <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> he always, everybody assumes that that's the song that broke up the band, but in essence it, that might, you know, it might've all kind of just because that was the big song for that particular album, you know, maybe, you know, that could be one of the reasons why, you know, it, it was, they fell out of favor with it. The first time I saw it performed was by Dennis Solo. Okay. Yeah, so they they went from um, the Kilroy tour. Yep. Till about, <clears throat> well, I don't know. It looks like they yeah, there's, there's almost a, thirty years, I would think. Yeah, it it didn't yeah. come back till twenty eighteen in in a set with a full time, and and it's just right. I just found it odd that they uh, put it in as a first encore. That was kind of uh you know that's kind of like a a big thing, you know, for them to make that the first song of the encore. Um, mm-hmm. Considering they hadn't played that song, like you said, in that many amount of years. You know, and it it was always a song that a lot of people always thought that helped, you know, break the band up and everything. So I was kind of surprised by that. Now, I did not expect it to really stay in the set list ever since that. And here we are six years later mm-hmm. and they still got it in the same slot. They're still playing it. What's your uh, what do you think? You think they're going to just maintain it like that? Um, or is this something um, that eventually you think they're going to fall out of a. Do you think it should stay in the set? What's your take on this whole matter? I, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, it, it, it's it, the weird thing about Roboto is, uh, I don't know, you know, Dennis, I think, was able to successfully kind of fit it into the middle of his set list. Yeah, because it's his song, you know, it, it so it kind of fits well with his catalog uh, in terms of the, the material that sticks is playing these days you know, which is a little, which, I mean, they're still playing a lot of dentist stuff, but it's definitely a little bit more leaning towards, you know, Tommy and, you know, a JY song here or whatever, but uh, it doesn't really fit anywhere else 
in the set list for them. It's not, you know, it's kind of song. It's so it's, it's a bit of an outlier. You know, it doesn't really sound like a stick song per se. So it makes sense that it would be an encore because it really, I know I sound like I'm rambling a little bit, but one of the reasons it works on the record is because it's the first song. You know, it doesn't really sound like anything else on the record either. Kilroy was here. Everybody goes, oh, you know, Kilroy was in Rock Up the Rock album or the band. And I don't think it was the song per se. I think it was that whole multimedia, you know, 10 minute video that they that they did before the show. And then the backstory, which some people may not have, they found it to be hokey or whatever. But I mean, and can I say... Can I say to anybody who thinks that Kilroy was here was a was a hokey backstory that the who did a whole album about a kid who was deaf, dumb and blind and played pinball? You know, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, these, you know, these are meant to be war and peace here, folks, the rock operas or concept albums, you know. But anyhow, um, yeah, so the album, in fact, I remember getting Kilroy was here and then you get rubato and you're like wow this is kind of weird like this is not this isn't a stick song this is totally different uh and to some degree i felt the same about too much time on my hands the first time i heard that but but not to the extent that i did with rubato then the rest of the album just sounds a little bit more like kind of cornerstone era sticks you know more more sticks ish typical sticks that we've we've become used to so Again, when you have a song like that, if you're a band like Sticks, you got to find a place to to fit it. And to me, that's just yeah. where else would you put it? Like you either are going to open with it, or you're going to open your encore with it. It to, to me, I don't see it working anywhere else. Yeah, especially with the you new know? material on the last two albums, the way they got that yeah. all uh, mixed into the set now, because it wouldn't fit in there right next to any of that stuff. You're absolutely yeah. right. And I don't think I don't think too much time on my hands was a great encore. No. It's a great song, but it's it's definitely an earlier set song. It just works better earlier in the set. So I'm glad they kind of moved that around because they were doing that as an encore for some time. Um, but you know, Styx is in that is in that rather you know like kind of Leonard Skinnerd ish uh, scenario where you know you got to end with "Come Sail Away." Like you just have to. You can't. You can't put that anywhere else in the set list. I mean, they did the uh, the album series where they did Grand Illusion and and Pieces of Eight. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people remarked, I mean, man, it's weird. You know, they're playing Come Sail Away kind of in the middle of the show because that's where it is on the record, you know? Yeah. But uh, but even then, you know, that's that that's the end of side one. If my memory serves, serves me correct for Grand Illusion. So it still has there's a there's a finality to it. That's why it works live as the as the closer, you know? And uh, I don't know, Ario Speedwag, you know, don't let him go. I mean, it's a great opener. It just, it's the opening of a record. It's, it's a great opener of a concert, all that kind of stuff. And that's not a song that's going to work as an encore. Um, you know, Renegade, again, it, it Renegade's one of those odd ones where you can kind of get away with it anywhere. I mean, Blue yeah. Collar Man, you know, you, Blue Collar Man, I don't know. I, I like Blue Collar Man in the middle of the show as well. Um, Fooling yourself. I mean, again, concert highlight, but yeah, where are you going to put it? You got all these songs. <laughs> I mean, it's the only place that it absolutely makes sense. And unless somebody says, God damn it, I'm sick of them playing Roboto, it's going to stay in the set. It's, you know, as much as I'd rather hear, um, you know, Sweet Madam Blue, yeah, Blue. Yeah. You know, or Light Up or, you know, something, maybe something a little bit earlier or, or whatever uh you know or the best of times you know i mean which i know they're not going to play i don't think they've ever played post dennis but there's a lot of songs that they could put in that spot uh mademoiselle you know another another great song that that we don't hear live you know we get we get rubato but <laughs> you know and and don't get me wrong rubato's a great great song it is it's, it's a great, a great song. it's a great live yeah. song too Sure. Yeah, it's a great encore. It it's not a great it's not a great eighth or ninth song in the set. Although again, when I saw Dennis do it, he pulled it off for whatever reason. Maybe because he's because he's a little more you know intimately associated with the song, and he plays it a little differently. You know, I think Styx's current version was a little more kind of they kind of rocked it up a little bit. To, mm -hmm. You know, because because that's their thing. You know, I mean, Tommy and JY have always wanted to be the rockers and you know dennis is, has sort of more of that theatrical sensibility 
So Dennis's version is more, you know, theatrical, put it in, you know, through the evening and portion of the show, maybe counterbalance a babe or something like that. But uh, where it sticks is like, you know, everything's got to kind of rock a little bit. You know, you don't, you don't get a lot of ballads at a stick show anymore. I don't think you really get any ballads at a stick show anymore. Come to think of it, unless you consider crystal ball a ballad, which or guess lady. Is. Yeah. Lady's not really a ballad. It's a, I mean, it's, at Still best, it's a power love song to his wife, though. But <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But I mean, Babe's a ballad. Well, here yeah. you go. Here's what Dennis did. He the last time we seen him at Gratwick, he did "Show Me the Way," then "Murbato," and then he went in a desert moon. So it kind of fits the same mode of those type songs, and it's cool because he sticks it right in the middle of them to kind of yeah break up the monotony of slow song. "Murbato's a faster song. Desert Moon's a deep, great song. Uh, you know, so it was. He did a great job of, like you said, of putting it in there. So it kind of mm-hmm. fit in there nice and snug there. And so I got to say, you know what? I think that it's a shame that Sticks couldn't figure out a way to pull off playing Babe. It was a it was a true concert highlight back in the day. Just that, you know, that twinkly intro and then the big fat chorus at the end, that nice little guitar solo, you know, along the lines of like a keep on loving you for uh, – or separate ways, you know, just that really good, solid mm-hmm. love song right in the middle of the set. But I, I get it. I mean, I don't think it's a song Gowan Gowan can sing. Maybe he just can't internalize it. It's not quite suited to his voice. But man, I mean, that was a that was a that was absolutely a live concert highlight for me when I used to see the classic lineup. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our take today on the Dennis DeYoung catalog and our question of the uh, thing. Stay tuned for more ranking the albums as well as um, questions. We're going to throw our reviewers ways here. (laughs) And and Dennis DeYoung, the offer still stands. Okay. (laughs) Contact, contact Joey through his YouTube channel. Uh, you, You got my backyard. I will cook you up some food. Last time I talked to you, you were, I believe you were gluten free. So I will, I will cook you a fantastic gluten free. I'll cook you whatever you want, man. You tell me what you need, make it happen. We'll do it in my backyard. The whole world's going to find out about it. What a great story it's going to be. Nobody can say you're retired anymore, Dennis. And I, and for God's sake, I hope you're not retired. If you don't play my backyard, Dennis. Play somewhere we can go see you live because we 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 miss you. That's a huge void in the live music scene. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, once again, uh, you can catch Tom Jennings if you want to p- pump your channel there. Your be up. Tuning in with Tom, T-H-O-M. Don't forget the H, the anxious silence, but I'm not. That's my new <laughs> tagline. What do you think? Very good. <laughs> and of course, uh, make sure you subscribe there and subscribe here if you haven't already. Um, we got a lot of good, fresh content coming your way. Uh, a lot of concerts coming up in the summer season right around the corner here. And, uh, as you probably seen a couple of our videos, we're going to be doing a lot more of these, uh, after show rankings, uh, to let you know how the show was, give you a little bit of heads up what to expect and some insight on the show. So that's one mm-hmm. thing I, I definitely think people want to see, they want to hear it and, uh, we're going to, we're going to deliver it. So yeah. All right. Well, till next time, this is Joe and Tom signing off. Good day. Peace out.